The next section that we're doing is based upon decades of da'wah experience of various du'at across the world. But I'm going to give you that, not over decades, I'm going to give it to you over an hour. And then the next couple of sections. So, you really need to understand this next section, and then you will save yourself decades. Not only will you learn how to give da'wah, I promise you, you will understand Islam in a better way. And this is not based upon our own whims and desires, this is actually based upon people of knowledge, discussions with people of knowledge. This is based upon the Qur'an, this is based upon the Sunnah, and this is something which should be obvious, but it's not really that obvious. Okay, I want full attention and full participation, so what I want you to do is this. I want you to tell me uncomfortable questions about Islam. Uncomfortable questions may be in the form of why does Islam X? Why do Muslim women X? Islamic law is Y. And I'm going to take your questions and I'm going to put them on the board. So Bismillah, let's begin. What's the first question? Huh? Okay, put that in the form of a question and put that in the form of a question that makes me uncomfortable. If you say to me four wives, I'll say yes please. <laughs> Joking. Why does Islam permit four wives? Thank you. Why four wives? Okay. Why do men, uh, men don't have to cover everyone's hijab? Men don't wear hijab. Men no hijab. Excellent. Why, why, why did the Prophet marry a nine-year-old child? The Prophet's wife, the Prophet's uh, wife Aisha Razital Anhu, age of marriage. Okay, nine. The year was nine. Why did you cut off the hand of Lydia? Hand of thief chopped off. Apostasy in Islam, Apo I'm, I'm, I'm assuming apostasy punishment, yes? Right, what else? Why can't women marry more than one person? Excellent. Women marry more than one. That's not really a particular uncomfortable question about Islam. That may be a general question about God. Any other questions? Why do women have to be accompanied by Yes. Why women need male guardian? Um, what I want to do is, I want to put down questions which are true about Islam. Because obviously Islam doesn't teach the bombing of churches. Yeah? So these are things which in Islam which are true, like the age of Aisha, like men not wearing, uh, wearing hijab. So something like, why do you know, Muslims kill Christian children and crucify them or something? That's you know, not really an uncomfortable true question because it's not... True, literally. Yes? Why pray five times a day? Thank you. Prophet, wives. Somebody else said something else as well. Segregation. Yeah, put down a question, please. Why do you stone homosexuals? Stone. Right. Yes. Con Islam 
and concubines. Yep. Okay, good. So he corrected the question in the sense that things which are true about Islam. We have capital punishment, right? Why is there capital punishment in Islam? Why? Under, everyone understand what capital punishment is? When a person by the state is killed because of a s killing that he actually did. What else? Why are women covered? Yeah, we did that. Sorry? Yep, shaking hands of opposite gender. Or touching opposite gender. Right, wealth. Why not drink alcohol or eat? Piggy. Why are men dressed virgins if they're dead? Men, virgins, if die. Yeah. Huh? Islam. One thing which is true is it regulated it. Didn't promote it, but one thing we can't deny is it regulated it. It didn't increase it, but it did regulate what was there. Good question. Everyone understand that? Can't sit in a setting of drinking. Thank you for bringing that up because. It's not exactly you drinking. You're not allowed to, and we have rules like this in Islam. So sometimes you're not permitted to do something which is imitating even a sin. Do everyone understand that? Yeah? It's not just about doing the sin, sometimes even being in the environment of someone sinning or imitating someone that's sinning. Okay, so for example, if there is a particular sect of Hindus who wear the color pink on uh, the first Saturday of the month. That's their trait. There's a particular sect of Hindus, I'm hypothetically saying, who, who, who wear the color pink on the first Saturday of every month. If Muslims start to just, oh my friends are doing it so I do it, we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to imitate even the disbelievers, even though we may not believe what they believe. We're not even allowed to imitate them. In a particular thing, so I'm not talking about like trousers and shirts because that's like universal thing, but a particular thing which is a, 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 a uh, of a particular religion, which imitates them, we can't do that. Uh, why can't I listen to music even though sometimes it calms my nerves? Yep, good, very good question. Why can't I listen to music? This is a good question. Because it's related to alcohol. Alcohol has some benefits. It's not only harmful. Music also has some benefits. It's not only harmful. Okay? So why can't I listen to music? What else? Sorry, I didn't get enough sisters. Yes, any sisters? Free will, predestination. Understanding it. Why can't I have friends from the opposite gender? Yep. Friends from opposite gender. Why is compulsory to fast? Very good. Compulsory to fast. Especially in a hot country, 20 hour fasts. Try to make it particular for Islam. Very good question. 
interest prohibited sisters yeah imitating we did that why okay you could put that in a sense why does hell exist I'm trying to make it broader Muslims not allow dogs in house Yeah, we did imitation. Why is that giving salam to someone who is doing salam? Sorry? Giving salam to someone who is doing salam. Giving salam to someone that's... Do so you're allowed to or you're not allowed to? Not allowed. To give salam to someone that's sinning? Yeah. Oh, I've never heard that before. Uh, is, is that... You mean a non-Muslim? Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I've never heard that, so I'm not sure if I can put that down. But we're not allowed to give salam to a... Actually, there's ikhtilaf about that. We're not allowed to choose a, a non-Muslim friend over a Muslim as a, as a personal guardian. Yeah? That's, that's something that's there. Preferring... Muslims over non-Muslims. That doesn't mean you're bad to them, but it simply means that you prefer the Muslims to the non-Muslims. Why are men allowed to marry women of different religions, but women aren't allowed to see? Good question. So men, Muslim men, can marry Christian, Jewish women, but that's not the same with Muslim women. Why do men grow their beards? Why do men grow their beards? Simple answer is women can't and they're jealous. <laughs> Are women now prevented from Jummah? Jummah? Okay, that's not really true. So put down things which are actually true. Because there's lots of misconceptions which are not true. Huh? Yep. There's ikhtilaf about two pieces and one piece, but we can say at least thobe above ankle. What else? Good question. Men inherit twice as much as women. Testimony of man of is worth more. Can you complete this? Is worth more in in financial transactions. Thank you. It's always good to know this stuff. Sorry. So it's not the case that it's always the case, but it's in financial transactions half. I don't know. I don't know about that. But let's stick to the uncomfortable questions. Yes, any more? No, think of an uncomfortable question in Islam. So an uncomfortable question is, why does niqab exist? Yes? Why does... Niqab exist? Right. Yeah, we have that guardian. What else? Um, why can't women lead even when they have a more relationship? Women be 
دي إمام أو خليفة. They're not allowed to be the Imam of a Jama'ah of men, and nor are they allowed to be the Khalifa. Uh, why were women not sent as prophets or messengers? Very good. No women prophets. Offensive jihad? Very good question. I like the way that you put that. Because that is there in the early, from the earliest times of Islam. Yes? So why can Muslims marry their cousins? No, that's allowed. No, I mean, in this day and age, people tend to find it sort of a taboo. So why does Islam permit? Islam permits cousin marriage. Right, let's have one last one and one really, really difficult one. And when, I'm, when other people are speaking for courtesy reasons, please don't speak because you're actually being rude to the person who's actually speaking. So just try and have one conversation. Let's have one last one. One last difficult question. Think of something really difficult. Don't make it too easy. Because this exercise is about throwing up. It's about getting it off your chest. It's about putting it all out there. Yes? How can you evolution and all this Yeah, it's not a really question about Islam. But let's just stick to something in Islam. Yes? That's not really difficult. <laughs> something difficult. There you go. Something a bit more like, yeah, you know, you can come to, you can come to my, uh, you can come to Washington, but I can't come to Medina. Why you have double standards? So let's look at some double standards. In Islam, Medina, Makkah, no non-Muslims. Okay, what else? Double standards in Muslims and non-Muslims? Yes, we have double standards in Islam. So for example, a Muslim is allowed to build a mosque in, uh, what's it called, uh, say, London. But a non-Muslim is not allowed to build a church in Makkah. Right? That's a double standard. So the double standard also exists in buildings. You can come to Washington or London and you can preach Islam, but I can't go to Makkah or Medina and set up a stall about Christianity. So... Double standards also in preaching. Okay, now we have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of uncomfortable questions. So, I remember a few years ago I had a bit of an experience with some uncomfortable questions. Probably one of my earliest experiences with an uncomfortable question. I was in Speaker's Corner, this was 2010, it was the winter time, it was very, very cold. There was this American Muslim speaker and from an African-American background who came and he was giving a talk about Islam and there's all these non-Muslims in the crowd. And he's really, really loud, he was built like a tank and he has a loud like African-American type of voice and whatever someone asks him just gives them the answer and he's talking, he's talking, he's talking. Everybody in the crowd was mesmerized by this guy. And there was this posh, skinny white guy in the crowd, right? And he goes, isn't it true in your religion, when you die and go to heaven, you get 40 virgins? And this big guy, you can imagine he's talking, he's giving answers, he's doing this, he's doing that. He stops. Inshallah. That's what he actually says. And I was in there thinking, what the heck? 
It doesn't even, like, no one understands what that means. Yeah? There's this me and this other Muslim guy in the crowd, the rest were non Muslims. Anyway, that's how, you don't un that's how you don't give an answer to an uncomfortable question. There's a clue. So, we have all these uncomfortable questions. What I want to do now is I want you to give me the answers. Okay. My friend. Why do women get half the inheritance of men? Sorry? Come here. Let's have a conversation. What's your name? Muhammad? Father, mashallah. So we're both students here at Nottingham University. I'm in this, what course are you in? Mechanical. mechanical engineering. Okay, he's in mechanical engineering. I'm also in mechanical engineering. I'm, say, a feminist, right? I believe that in all aspects, women have to have the exact same right as a man, sometimes more. Okay, so, Muhammad, how are you doing? You okay? Like you good? Yeah. Um, just had a question. Uh, you know, I hope you don't mind. You know, I, I see you're Muslim. I'm not really from a Muslim background. I'm, from an atheistic sort of background. Um, I just wanted to know, you know in Islam, women get half the inheritance that men get. Isn't that wrong? I mean, why, why, why is that the case? If I could approach it in this way, I believe I would take this person to a person who has more knowledge of this. I personally have no knowledge of women. I mean, okay. I say no knowledge for them. Okay. I have very less knowledge. Okay, so how about you know, the fact that women have to cover up and they have to wear very modest clothes? Oh, yeah, uh, that, if you ask me, I believe, you know, it's, it's with respect and modest. Could you speak a bit louder? Uh, it's with respect to modest and... Uh, and uh, so you're saying women that don't wear hijab are not modest? <laughs> like my wo my the family, the, uh, my sister, my mom, they don't... It's quite offensive. No, but, I mean, you, you believe Islam is true, right? Yeah. So, women, like, the men don't have to wear the hijab? Men do have hijab. Really? Yeah. You're not wearing one. Uh, but, but the hijab is not the face for men, I believe. So, the hijab for the men is different to the hijab of the women? Yes. Why? Because men and women are not the same. Okay. It doesn't make any sense though. I don't really get that. Like, as a man, you can marry four wives, right? As a Muslim man. Yeah. yeah. Well, can a woman marry four husbands? No. That's a bit unfair, isn't it? There's a lot of issues behind. Like? How shall I put this? Uh... <laughs> Sorry, no one's allowed to help him out. I can see some people want to put their hands up. It's, this is the lamb to the slaughter. <laughs> it's Bakara Eid and we have a nice Bakara with us. Pretty healthy one. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, say, so, say, say, for example, the woman actually has a child. Okay. Where's a child? I mean, she gives birth to a child. Uh, how would she know who's the father? Well, she's married to the father, so... Not one. I said four. So now okay, okay, that's a good question. I like the way he did that. So what he basically said is, there's a woman, she has four husbands, right? And she has intercourse with all four on different days. She doesn't know who the Child father is. Fathers. Well, in this case, the woman's barren. She doesn't have the ability to conceive, and she doesn't want to conceive. And neither do her husbands want her to conceive, but she has four husbands. Mm -hmm. So I've changed the example slightly. Now, why is it wrong? I still have some moral value behind it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, let me try thinking. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Poor guy. Okay, yes, my brother, what were you going to say? No, the brother back there. By the way, this is for someone who hasn't done the course before. If you've done the course before, you have to sit down. Have you done the course before? No. Say? This course. Okay, so why is it a man is allowed to marry four but a woman is not? Yeah, that's the course, so sit down. <laughs> There's a point that we're doing this exercise. The point is not to give the answer according to the course, but thank you. Right, what was happening in that conversation between me and Brother Muhammad? What was actually happening? The answers that he was actually giving... Were they satisfying me? Okay. Were the answers leading to other questions or were they resolving questions? Okay. Now the fundamental problem in the conversation was not to do with the questions. Because if Brother Muhammad is there and I give him one after another question, if he happens to somehow know the answer to one of them, I'll ask him another one, I'll ask him another one, I'll ask him another one. But the problem here is this. If you try and use your logic and your reasoning to try and give him an answer, then he can try and change the question and ask you in a different way. So for example, one of the ways that the question is answered about a man marrying four rather than uh, you know, a woman being able to marry four is historically there's always more women than men. But someone can change the example and say, what about India where they have one million female abortions a year, therefore there's more men than women. What about India? So now your example's changed. Fundamentally, this is what I want you to understand. In this conversation, there are two people who are not actually talking on the same level. There is a Muslim who is looking at the world through lenses, green lenses. And he's looking at the world as green. And there is a non-Muslim who is looking at the world through red lenses. So what's happening in the conversation is... The Muslim is saying, this is green, this is green, this is green. The non-Muslim is saying, this is red, this is red, this is red. Why is that? The reason is, this is the case is because the Muslim is looking at the world through the lenses of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. He believes that this man called Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final messenger of God. Therefore, whatever he says is true. When the non-Muslim doesn't believe that, he maybe believes in God, maybe he doesn't believe in God, maybe he's a Christian, a Jew, a Lady Gaga, whatever. There are two people talking from a completely different perspective. For example, there was an atheist girl which I met at Speaker's Corner. I was speaking to her. She says, I don't agree with capital punishment. I don't believe a life for a life. Now I can give her an explanation why that's good, why a life for a life is important, whatever. She's, according to her logic, she said, even if somebody kills a million people, you're not allowed to take his life. Yeah? She's looking at the world through red glasses, I am looking at the world through green glasses. Now, what I want to do is this. These are aspects of Islam that we all believe in and accept. What if I come along and I tell you something? I tell you hypothetically, before you do takfir on me, hypothetically, there is a sahih narration of the Prophet ﷺ that you have to wear a yellow hat on Sundays. Hypothetically. Raise your hand if you're going to wear a yellow hat on Sundays. 
Why? Because the Prophet said so. Whether you understand it or not, you do understand he's a messenger. Likewise, if I take a pen and I change every single one of these things, and these things are actually true. So it's not the case that there's women, no women prophets, it's only women prophets and no male prophets. Hell doesn't exist. Dogs are allowed to be in the house. You're allowed to prefer Muslims and non-Muslims together. Muslims, Muslim men can marry Christians and Jews, Muslim women can marry Christian men and Jews. Women, men don't have to grow beards. The thobe doesn't have to be above the ankle. The men and women both, in fact, the man gets one share of the inheritance and the woman gets five. No offensive jihad. Women can marry more than one. Muslim men and women can both marry two each, right? Men have to wear hijab. Aisha's age was 25. The ch you don't chop off the hand of the thief, you instead give him a pancake. <laughs> Apostasy law doesn't exist. Women don't need guardians, but actually men need guardians. We don't pray five times a day, we pray seven. Women can be the, in fact there is no such thing as the Khalifa. The Prophet say he never married, segregation is not allowed, we don't stone, Islam has no slavery or concubines, there is no capital punishment, you can't shake the hands of uh, opposite gender. Islam never regulated slavery. It's not compulsory to fast in Ramadan for one month. But it's compulsory to fast Mondays and Thursdays throughout the year, but there's no Ramadan. Do you guys see what I'm doing? I'm just changing everything, assuming this is Islam. So you have to fast Mondays and Thursdays throughout the year. What does this say? I don't even know what that says. Um, testimony of male is uh, equal to two of a female. Okay, in this case, the testimony of a male is half that of a female, so it's actually the opposite. Men have to wear niqab, women have to shave their heads. Okay, Islam doesn't permit cousin marriage, Islam only permits interracial marriage. No, ma no marriage even within your own race. So a Malay can't marry a Malay, he has to marry a Japanese. I'm changing everything, assuming this is Islam. But, if you believe this man is a messenger of Allah and all of these rules are, are changed in an arbitrary way, completely arbitrary, even the examples I give may not be relevant, change them how you like. Will you believe this is true? Do you see what the problem is here? The problem is not these questions. The problem is who are these questions? Sorry, who came with these particular things? Because what I can do is this, I can be a feminist and I can look at Islam and I can say, do you know what? Islam is cruel to women because in Islam a woman gets half the inheritance that a man gets. A woman in financial transactions, she gets, uh, she has half the testimony. She also has to wear the niqab which the man doesn't have to wear. Therefore, Islam is oppressive to women. But I could also be Say, somebody could come along and they are a Memonist. Anyone heard of a Memonist? A Memonist is the opposite of a feminist. He thinks women have too many rights. So a Memonist can come along and say, Islam doesn't oppress women. Islam oppresses men and chooses women over men. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever has two daughters, and I have two daughters, whoever has two daughters and he takes care of them, he will go to Jannah. Is there a Sahih Hadith about two sons? Yes or no? No. So having two daughters will take you to paradise, but two sons will not. A Memonist can also say, the best jewelry, the best material is gold. Are women allowed to wear gold? Are, women, are men allowed to wear gold? No. Therefore Islam oppresses women. 
What's the best cl uh, cloth? Silk. Men allowed to wear silk? Women allowed to wear silk? When there is a war, the men have to go and die to protect the women. Do the women have to die to protect the men? No. In Islam, when you actually look at it from a feminist perspective, it looks like it oppresses women. When you look at it from a feminist perspective, it looks like it oppresses men. It doesn't matter what you think. What matters is, even if all of these things change, in whatever way, the only question that is relevant is, is it true? The claim that la ilaha illallah, there is nothing worthy of worship except the one creator, and Muhammad Rasulullah, is this claim true? Because if this claim is true, all of this is irrelevant. This is all totally irrelevant. I could come along and change all these laws in an arbitrary way. So when me and a non-Muslim are conversing, I am looking at the world through Islam, through green lenses, and I'm saying green, 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 green. The non-Muslim is saying red, 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 red. The only way that I can show him any of this makes sense is if I take off my glasses and I allow him to see the world through my glasses. Then he'll say, oh, it's green. So fundamentally, it's about the question, is Islam true? It's not about why does Islam X, Y, Z? Because Islam could have not X, Y, Z. It could have been ABC. It could have been totally different. It could have been totally different. The only question that is worth asking is, is it true? Because if it's true, what comes from truth is? Truth. Another way of putting it is this. What's your name? Azmir. Azmir. So Azmir, you have been diagnosed with a rare disease. You come to me and I'm a world expert in that disease. I have my certificates from Oxford, from Harvard. I have a research team. I'm acknowledged as the world leading consultant in that disease. You only have about a week to live unless you come to me and you get medicines from me. And by the permission of Allah, you'll be cured. You come to my office with a disease, acknowledging that I am the person who knows best about this disease. If you come to me and I say to you, right, Azmir, you need to take this particular recipe, this particular prescription. You need to take medicine X, medicine Y, medicine Z. Okay? You need to do exercise twice a week and you need to stop eating tomatoes. Okay. You have two choices. Number one, you can say, here I obey. You take that and you say, this guy knows more than me and you carry on. Or you say, how do I know this works? How do I know that works? How do I know that works? I tell you it works because of this. You read it in a book. Then you say, how do I know that that experiment was done in the right way? I show you the experiment results. You say, how do I know these results are true? I want to meet the participants who actually did it. In fact, I'm going to do the exam myself. Why can't I eat tomatoes? I try to give you the science behind it. I try to explain that. You say, well, I haven't tested out the science myself. Are you going to spend five years doing the research behind this medicine? Or are you just going to accept it? You're going to accept it because there's someone who knows more than you. And as long as you can prove that I know more than you, you have to accept what I say. All that we need to do is we need to show why this message is from Allah. Because Allah is all-knowing. Human beings are not all-knowing. Therefore, human beings have to submit to Allah. Now, someone may say, well, that's very irrational. No, it's not, because human beings, we all the time, we submit to high authorities of knowledge. When we're in school, we listen to the historians, we listen to the geographers, we listen to the science teachers, we listen to the people who know more than us. This is not irrational. What's irrational is to believe in something without evidence. So the only question that we need to go back to is, is Islam true? Because if it's true, then all of this is irrelevant. It, we'll accept it. Now someone may say, 
uh, but it doesn't feel right. I don't, I don't feel right that, I don't know, um, men get twice the share of women. Or I don't feel right that if you have two daughters, you go to paradise, but if you take care of them, but not if two sons. I don't feel right. Well, the thing about feelings is that feelings are different all across the whole world. Your feelings don't change reality. Feelings are just whatever's inside. You may feel this way, another human being may feel that way. The truth is the truth and it's not affected by your feelings, whims, desires. All of these things can be answered in one particular way. Is Islam true? Because if it's true, khalas. And we know this through a beautiful story of when the pagan Arabs, they came to Abu Bakr anhu. They came to him and they said to him, did you hear what your companion said last night? Who's the companion? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what, what were they referring to? The night journey. That he claimed he went to Jerusalem and to heaven back in one night. And they were laughing so much about this because they thought finally we can show Islam is false. So they came to Abu Bakr Razi Anhu. What did he say? What did he say? He said, did he say it? If he said it, I believe it. Why? Because he had evidence, he had belief, and he had reasons to believe that belief, that this man was telling the truth. So whatever he says is true. The only question that we need to go back to when it comes to all of these questions is, is Islam true? Because if we try to use our reason and our logic to answer these questions, we're going to go around in circles. Why is it we have to pray five times a day and not seven? You can never give a rational answer. The only answer you can do is, I can show you why Islam is true, this is why we pray five times a day. With all of these things, we need to fundamentally go back to why Islam is true. Okay, I've said the main part of the Dawah training course. We don't teach people to answer these questions. Answering these questions is irrelevant. What's relevant is who has come with the truth. Has Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi come with the truth? If he has, khalas, finish, done, we follow. If he hasn't, we don't follow. Simple as that. Okay. Does everyone understand that or is there some concerns, questions, comments on that? Okay, good. The question the brother is asking is, even if, some, if someone accepts, okay, fine, if Islam is true, then all of this is irrelevant, right? How do you start that conversation? How do you prove, how do you even take it from these questions to Islam? And then how do you show Islam is true? That's after lunch. That's the rest of the course. My particular thing which I'm saying here is, about the concept that these questions cannot be answered directly. You have to go back to the source, right? They are actually dawah training courses which take you down a rabbit hole, which is two weeks of how to answer the question about women, two weeks about how to answer the question about jihad. We're not teaching that stuff because that is actually the wrong way of doing things. If two people come from two different worldviews, one person is a secular humanist, one person is a Muslim, they're of course going to have different moral compasses. They're of course going to have different sentiments and feelings about particular issues. The question is not about that, the question is, is it true? Any other questions before lunch? Because this is the part where if you get this part, all the rest is going to be smooth. If you don't agree with the part, don't be shy not to raise your hand. Just say, look, I don't, I don't agree at all. And we've had that in the past. We've had some people saying, look, I don't, this doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. Anything was just aside? Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. Good question. Okay. 
the question he's asking, what if someone says, no, 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 I want to know why it is in Islam that you have offensive jihad. I don't care whether it's true or not, I want to know why. Well, here's, in a very polite way, what you have to do is this. You have to simply say, look, you will not be able to understand why this is the case. About offensive jihad, about women, about men, whatever. You will not be able to understand it unless you understand a simple formula, which is this. God is all-knowing, human beings are not, therefore human beings submit to God. Is this from God? That's the only question. Because there are things in the world which we cannot comprehend. Even in science, we cannot comprehend it. For example, in quantum mechanics, in the subfield of physics, we have particles that exist in two places at the same time. The concept of time as we know it now is very different in those scenarios. There's a whole bunch of things which are counterintuitive, non-commonsensical, irrational, but it's there. The reality is you may never understand the wisdom behind something. You may understand it in hereafter, but all you need to do is, is it true? That's all you need to go back to. Is it true? Because if it's true, we accept it. If it's not true, we don't accept it. Here in Malaysia, say 10,000 years ago, there was some ancient population that lived here, right? Some ancient population which had spears, which had swords, which was some ancient population who didn't have much technology. Maybe they had boats. Say there is an ancient Malay person who we met, say, the brother went and he met this Malay person 10,000 years ago, you had a time machine, you went back. And you told this Malay person, in the future, there's going to be these big things that are going to fly in the sky, these planes. And while you're on the plane, you can access this thing called Wi-Fi. And using this Wi-Fi, you can talk to your mother on Skype when she's in Australia, even though you're flying over Europe. And not only can you talk and see each other, you are connected via satellites. Do you think this Malay person 10,000 years ago would believe you? They would say it's magic. They would say it's irrational. They would say it's impossible. They would say it's incomprehensible. Because their knowledge is limited. So they think something is impossible, or they think something is irrational, or they think something is non-commonsensical. Non Yet, are those things true? Yes or no? They are true. We know them to be true because we have no more knowledge. So we have a little bit more knowledge than the people who existed 10,000 years ago. How much knowledge do we have compared to Allah? So if we submit to a higher authority because they have more knowledge, and that is a rational thing to do, why wouldn't we do that with Allah? Islam has a simple, simple, simple formula. And here's how we can try and boil down to that. Is Islam a religion of rationality or blind following? Raise your hand if you think Islam is about blind following. One, two, three. Okay. Doesn't Allah say, Sameetna wa ta'na, hear and obey? That sounds like blind following. Okay. How many people here believe Islam is rational? Okay. Allah says in the Quran, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of night and day, there are signs for those with intelligence. Do you not reason? Do you not use your mind? Do you not think? So there's verses about rationality, using your mind. There's also verses about blind following. So which one is it? Excellent. Can you just say that a bit more loudly so everyone can understand? Uh, so we use our rationality to take Allah as our foundation, as our standard for everything, and then we go to, uh, from there we go to blank following. Excellent. Does everyone understand what he said? Zakh So what he's basically saying is this. I'm going to put it in the form of an example. One day you fall sick, 
you wake up in the morning, you have three particular locations you can go to. So you feel sick, you're really, really ill, you can go to three things. You can go to the doctor, you can go to the baker, or you can go to the lawyer. Which one of these three things is rational to go to? The doctor, the lawyer, or the baker? Doctor. So you use your rationality to go to the doctor. Then the doctor gives you a prescription which is beyond your comprehension. Do you blindly follow the prescription or do you try and challenge it rationally using what knowledge you have and try to do the experiments yourself? You blindly follow it. So, Islam is in a particular way that you can arrive at the truth that Islam is true using your mind. But once you know that this is the truth, that is when you submit your intellect. You can show that Islam is true, we can arrive there, but that at that point you accept blindly what Allah says. So for example, the Quraysh, the pagans before Islam, they used to mock the Quran, they used to mock Islam because in Islam it mentions there is a tree which grows out of Jahannam, out of hellfire, which grows in Jahannam rather, in hellfire. What happens to wood in fire? It burns. So how can a tree exist which burns, which doesn't burn? Likewise, in Islam, and the Quraysh used to make fun of Islam because of this. Likewise, in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ says, charity doesn't decrease wealth. Charity does not decrease wealth. But when you physically give charity, your bank account goes down. Does it not? So there are things in Islam which are supra-rational. There are things which are beyond rationality. This is not just only the case in Islam, it's Case, it's the case in every single field of knowledge. Human knowledge has some limits. Even if you're not Muslim, you would realize that. All human knowledge and what we can comprehend has certain limits. What Islam is saying to you is, you can arrive at the truthfulness of Islam, but once you arrive at that truth, that is when you submit. So, according to some scholars, when in the Quran it says, do you not reason? Do you not reflect? Do you not think? Do you not use your mind? This is for the disbelievers to arrive at the truthfulness of Islam. When it comes to hear and obey, submit, that is exclusively for the Muslims because they've already arrived at the truthfulness of Islam. So there's no contradiction between saying Islam is rational even though there are parts of it which are completely blind following. Make sense? Yes. Can it be vice versa? Blind would, following would lead to rationality. That is the case in a lot of places, like speak from my country, where uh, people just are born with Islam, do not understand it, but with experience and slowly the rationality comes as, as time goes on. Let me explain that in a slightly different way. Yeah. I wouldn't put it exactly in the way that you put it, but I know what you're trying to get across. Every single human being is bo born upon the fitrah. So we already have an acknowledgement that there is a creator, which is why even people who are not brought up with a religion, in times of extreme distress, we have this universal human experience of people calling upon God. When they are diagnosed with cancer, or when they're on a ship that's, that's about to drown, or so on and so forth. So Islam is true, so when somebody is brought up in a society, they just follow that religion. Over time, they will come to a time where they'll start questioning, but they were initially blindly following. So you're right, that can happen. But the missing ingredient is the fitrah, and the role of the fitrah we're going to cover in the next couple of section, ne the next section, inshallah. And then what you said is going to become clearer. But jazakallah khair for that, because that's, that's another way of putting it as well. But that doesn't take away from the point that Islam is rational and it has elements of blind following.